Uh, welcome everybody to today's colloquium, which also happens to be the last session this summer, and we're finishing on a high note. And it is my pleasure and my privilege to introduce today's speaker. Um, David Hall is Professor of Media, Music and Culture in the School of Media and Communication at the University of Leeds. He is the author of uh, various uh, widely read books. Um, let me just mention one at this point, and that is The Cultural Industries. Um, the fourth edition just came out in 2019. Um, he's also published Culture, Economy and Politics, The Case of New La Labour, uh, that was co-written with Kate Oakley, um, David Lee and Melissa Nisbet. Um, and he's also the author of Why Music Matters, that was published in 2013, and um, Creative Labour Media uh, Work in Three Cultural Industries, that was uh, published or co-written with Sarah Baker. He studied at Goldsmith University of London, which we know at the Tsemke very well, and uh, this is also where he um, had his first teaching appointment. Um, and then he um, moved on to Leeds in 2007 and from June 2010 to December 2013, he was the head of the Institute of Communication Studies. Um, this was the name of the School of Media and Communication prior to August 2014. Much as we've already heard of his research is uh, focused on music, um, on how the music industry has changed. Um, and that was, of course, at the center of his book, Why Music Matters, very obviously. Um, he's also known for his research on the media industries and media production. Um, his book, My Cult um, The Cultural Industries, that was published with Sage, is an analysis of changes and continuities in television film music, publishing and other industries since the 1980s. And let me say that it's been a bestseller, right? Um, it's gone through various um, editions. Um, also a book that has been widely cited is the book I mentioned before, Creative Labor, Media Work in Three Cultural Industries uh, that was co-written with Sarah Baker. Uh, his work has been translated into many different languages and um, he has had the privilege to travel the world, to spend some time at interesting universities and research uh, faculties. In 2019, he was doing research um, on, uh, well, you were at the MIT, right, in Boston. This is where we met for the first time. And so um, it's such a pleasure to have you here. And as we said initially, it would be great to have you here in person once this horrible pandemic has ended and we can all go back to our normal lives and travel safely. Thank you so much for coming. The floor is all yours, David. Thanks, Delia. Thanks for inviting me. And yeah, I'm really sorry that I can't be there. Uh, I've known Andreas for many years and yes, it was a real pleasure to meet you two years ago when we, uh, when we lived together, didn't we? We shared a house. You were on the third floor. I was on the ground floor with our very nice landlord and landlady in between us. So, uh, yeah, I look back on those times very fondly. So today I want to talk about um, what you see on the title uh, slide. Um, and let's hope all this works. But early discussion of the effects of digitalization on media and culture were speculative. And like so much speculation, much of it resolved um, into a battle between optimists and pessimists and constant change and considerable uncertainty made it difficult to assess the situation with any clarity. However, in recent years, while of course constant mutation remains a feature of the cultural landscape, in major forms such as television, film, games, book publishing and music, a certain degree of stability can be noted. A new set of arrangements that look set to last at least for a few years, maybe even a decade or two before the next inevitable waves of transformation come along. Central to this relative stabilization 
are those entities that have increasingly come to be known as digital platforms. Debates about the effects of digitalization on media production and consumption increasingly take the form of discussions of the concept of platformization. In the well-known 2018 article, Nieborg and Powell refer to the platformization of cultural production, by which, as you see on the slide, the penetration of digital platforms into the web and app ecosystems, fundamentally affecting the operations of the cultural industries. By the cultural industries, they mean, as I tend to, those industries most involved in the production and distribution of culture. In more recent work with Brooke Duffy, including a formidable collection of articles by themselves and others in social media and society, Nieborg and Paul have elaborated this concept further. And just to say briefly that I know some people are dubious about the concept of platforms, and it's certainly not uncommon to hear Tolton Gillespie's article from 2010 on the politics of platforms cited as evidence that the term is doomed to misuse and abuse. Gillespie was writing rather brilliantly, in my opinion, about a phase in the use of the term that has now been superseded. And in any case, whatever doubts people have about the term, it's clear that it's here to stay. I find Josie van Dyck and her colleagues' uh, discussion of the concept among the most useful. Um, and uh, for some reason, I've managed to delete the slide where I summarize um, um, van Dyck et al's conception. But um, those of you who know their book, uh, 28 from 2018 platform society which I, I think many of you will you'll remember that they place particular emphasis on uh, datification and on the idea of seeing any particular platform as part of an interconnected set of of, uh, of platforms uh, emphasizing systemic factors um but how, how, how were those uh, ideas applied to cultural production and consumption? In the article where they first developed their ideas, Nieborg and Paul focus on examples from news and games. And they talk about how um, digital news platforms such as BuzzFeed and the Huffington Post have pioneered what they call a new mode of news production, distribution and monetization whereby instead of news relying on the judgment of professional journalists, it becomes reliant on metrics about what audiences are responding to based on identifying popular search terms, social media topics and calculated production costs and so on. And they also claim that this system involves an increasing dependence on the GAFAM oligopoly. And I think this approach by Nieborg and Paul and their various collaborators fits with an increasing and in, in many respects justified distrust of platforms on the part of publics and policymakers. But what I want to consider today um, is whether that approach really captures the complexities and ambivalences of the current moment in the development of platforms in the realm of culture. Putting aside the issue of whether Niebuhr, Paul, Duffy and so on, whether their approach is the right one, I think they do usefully focus our attention on the question of how different cultural and media forms are being shaped and reshaped by the rise of digital platforms. My own main current research program is focused on the issue of how we might understand the role of platforms in the realm of one, the, for me, fascinating cultural form, music, and certainly a protean uh, cultural form, 
I think one of the reasons that it's an interesting domain, among many others, is that it, is that it was the first major uh, cultural form, communicative form, where the stabilization associated with platforms has taken place. But also, I think music has a fascinating relationship to everyday cultural experience that's often neglected in media and culture and communication studies. I mean, the relationship of music to that everydayness is neglected in media and communication studies, not everyday media and cultural experience. I've been working on these uh, issues for a couple of years now, and I'm hoping to explore them in greater international and historical depth um, as part of a five-year research project that begins in December, which, as you'll see, is called Music Culture in the Age of Streaming. So I'd just like to discuss some of my current research today to suggest some of the complexities and ambivalences surrounding platforms, which I think may be in danger of being understated in some current approaches to platformization. Um, so after briefly, briefly outlining the rise of music streaming, I'd like to discuss some issues concerning the political economy of music, including the current controversy over whether the arrival of digital platforms such as Spotify and Apple Music have damaged the ability of musicians to earn sustainable livings for making music, further entrenching longstanding inequalities. Um, this, uh, I don't know about in Germany, but this is a very live debate in Britain and uh, North America at the moment. Um, so much so that tomorrow, actually, uh, the House of Commons, you know, the UK Parliament, one of the houses of the UK Parliament is delivering its report on the economics of music streaming. Um, in response to the, these public and media concerns. So that's the first part. And then if I have time, I hope uh, 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 I'll discuss um, what I consider to be some of the limitations of existing critiques of, of music streaming's effects on musical culture. So moving away from political economy questions to cultural questions. Um, um, if I can sum up my approach, I think existing critiques are marked excessively by a certain kind of a particular kind of political economy approach and by what I would consider to be a version of uh, rather traditional mass culture criticism, whereas my own approach draws on, well, on political economy, particularly the cultural industries version of political economy associated with writers such as Bernard Miege and Nicholas Garnham on the critical theory of writers such as uh, Benjamin and, and Nancy Fraser, cultural studies approaches such as those of Williams, Gilroy and Matt Robbie, uh, popular music studies of, of people like Simon Frith, and more generally sociology of culture and critical media industry, in, industry studies in order to try and develop a more dialectical critique of platforms. So starting with that first part, um, uh, I think the best known music streaming platforms will be familiar to many of you. I imagine that many of you will use at least one of them. Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music, Deezer and YouTube's uh, subscription and advertising supported services. And uh, uh, along with the services offered by the Chinese web giant Tencent, these are now central to everyday musical activity across much of the world and is set to become even more significant in the years ahead. And there's a basic definition of music streaming platforms uh, offering on-demand access to large catalogues of audio or audiovisual content centered on music. And there's a free version uh, uh, advertising supported or subscription or some sort of hybrid of the two. Um, music streaming now accounts for over 60% of global revenue from recorded music. Um, many of you will remember 
predictions that the music industry was doomed in some way, finished as illegal downloading spread in the early 21st century. And as you can see here from the overall curve, starting from 2001, a kind of peak year, uh, revenues plummeted, and you'll see that uh, if you can make out the small writing, that since 2014, revenues have recovered rapidly, and in fact, the industry has begun, begun to thrive. And that recovery has been led by streaming, and the section in dark blue on the graph indicates the rapid growth of streaming and its economic importance and how that has malted the revival, the recovery of the industry. The red section shows the diminishing sales of physical musical artifacts, i.e. CDs, vinyl uh, and cassettes. Um, people often ask about vinyl when I give talks about this topic and um, uh, it's grown a little but it's still of minimal economic importance. So we've seen massive media coverage of music streaming um, and in particular, in recent years, there's been an emphasis on popular critiques of this new system centered on streaming, with many protests from stars and ordinary musicians and their fans about a perceived lack of money coming to musicians from streaming. And again, I'm wondering whether this is apparent in Germany. Um, I'd be very interested to know whether that um, the media coverage has, has been preoccupied with these questions to the same degree that it has. Taylor Swift is just one of many artists who's been associated with this, um, this controversy, this set of controversies. But I think there are many misconceptions about music streaming platforms that have arisen perhaps as a result of this heated media coverage. It's important to understand from the offset, and many people do not understand this. I'm sure you people do, but many people do not, that music streaming platforms do not make or commission music, and they don't even own any rights to music. You know, they don't own any of the copyrights, which are fundamental, as you know, to all cultural industry activity. Um, Instead, what they do is make vast catalogues of music available by a license ag agreement with what are conventionally called rights owners or rights holders. And by rights owners, in the case of music, I mean mainly the three major multinational music companies, Universal, Sony and Warner, plus a, a great number of independents. Um, the big companies, however, dominate ownership of rights, the three big companies. And there are two key types of, of copyright in music. There's the rights to the recordings, and there's the rights to the underlying songs or compositions. And the record companies, the recording rights holders, pay the performers of music and the owners of the song rights or the publishing rights pay the songwriters. Okay, if that's a little bit hard for you to get hold of, even though that's absolutely the most fundamental thing you could know about the music industries and how it works, that distinction between recording rights and song rights, the main thing I want you to take away from this slide is that music streaming platforms don't pay musicians it's rights holders that pay them okay so i'm just trying to establish some basic factual foundations here before we move on to some analytical implications so the major rights holders who are cultural industry companies okay they make their money from the ownership of copyrights and the music streaming platforms which are technology companies, the tech companies that make their money from subscriptions, advertising and datification. These two companies, sets of companies exist in an uneasy state of 
cooperation, i.e. a mixture of cooperation and competition. They cooperate by signing deals, but they compete for revenues. So music streaming platforms get 33% of what they take from us, the consumers, and from advertisers, and the rights holders take 67%. And each set of companies would like to have more. That 367 split is the result of kind of historical development. It's a kind of tense standoff. And there's always a sense that warfare could break out. And one of the uh, examples of where warfare has broken out is the dispute between the major rights holders and YouTube, where YouTube are considered to be particularly guilty of not paying enough money to the rights holders um, as a result of the safe harbor provisions in the um, um, EU's Directive on Electronic Commerce and other similar laws in other countries. So in the next few slides, I want to explore some analytical implications of understanding these political, economic and organisational realities of the music industries for understanding digital platforms in the realm of culture. So let, let's start with some here. Um, what I've just described means that, first of all, we shouldn't overstate the power of the music streaming platforms, the tech companies, as I think happens in a lot of the discussion of platformization. But nor, on the other hand, should we overestimate the power of the cultural industry's rights holders. It's a kind of state of cooperation, as I've already said. The music streaming platforms are massively reliant on the major rights holders, but the rights holders depend on the music streaming platforms. And it's important to point out that in the debates about platforms, which are raging in every single area of culture at the moment, as you know, both the music streaming platforms and the rights holders defend the new system. They claim that it's repaired the damage caused by the digitalization crisis that I referred to earlier through increasing revenues. And they also both emphasize that the new system has allowed a proliferation of musical products and of music creators. They say that a new sector of digital distribution companies now connect do-it-yourself and self-releasing musicians with directly with audiences via music streaming platforms, allowing people to bypass their system. So, and, and in this system, they point out, and it's true, you know, it's partially true that creators can increasingly make, or keep hold of their copyrights. And they portray these developments, the parallel oligopolies of the tech companies and the cultural industry companies portray these developments as a, a democratization. The problem is that these self-releasing DIY musicians, first of all, um, they have to compete for attention in a vast system with all the other musicians and tracks that are on there, includes, including the artists that are signed to the big record companies and that have the marketing muscle of those major record companies behind them. And th this involves a familiar problem for those of us who study platforms, the problem of abundance, just getting your head around the sheer scale of cultural product that is available. There are roughly 70 million tracks available on Spotify and also on Apple. It's more or less the same stuff, though not quite. It's difficult to know that there's, there's mainly overlap. And by the way, I should point out that, you know, probably a couple of million of these things are per podcasts. So maybe it's, you know, 68 million. It's really difficult to know the exact figures. But the key points for us are that more and more tracks are competing for audience attention. And 
more and more rights holders and music creators are now competing for a share of what is actually still a diminished amount of revenue from recorded music. Because even though there's been a recovery, it's, if you were just for inflation, it's still not back to what it was in the peak year of 2000. So this is the fundamental problem of music creators and what they can earn, what musicians are going to get out of this system. Massive competition and still ultimately a diminished pie to fight over. So how do we understand these controversies about musicians' earnings in the light of this? Now, one important thing to say is that arguably more attention should be being paid to the cultural industry rights holders than to the tech company music streaming platforms. But in our world of media and communication studies, all the talk is about the platforms and hardly any of it about the cultural industry companies in my experience. Maybe it's different in your worlds. And as I've already said, music streaming platforms don't pay musicians. They pay rights holders on the basis of a, you know, an interesting but complex system. It's essentially a, sh a share of the total streams. It's called a pro rata system. I can go into that in more detail in the Q&A. And then rights holders pay musicians on the basis of the contracts that musicians have signed with them. So the, at the moment, of the 67% that I mentioned earlier, that the music streaming platforms give over to the rights holders, 52% of that goes to the recording rights holders, and 15% of it goes to the holders of the rights to the songs, the underlying songs, you know, that people use to make their recordings. The average rate of royalty for recording artists is around 25% now. So recording artists get about 25% of that 52%. Songwriters, for various interesting historical reasons that I won't recount here, get a higher royalty rate, around 75%, but of a lower cut. And roughly, it works out the same. 25% of 52%, 75% of 15%, they're not that far apart. But so you're getting a picture of how it's paid out. And you might be thinking, well, hang on, 25%, what happens to the, the other 75%? That's being kept by the record companies. The 75%, what happens to the other 25%? That's being kept by the publishing companies. So shouldn't be shouldn't it be here that the controversy is focused rather than on the music streaming platforms? That's not to say that the music streaming platforms are wonderful and perfect and, uh, and should be uh, 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 should go without criticism. But as this uh, slide says, music streaming platforms are just one part of a complex system. The vilification of music streaming platforms may be misplaced or at least exaggerated. The problem needs to be understood as a general systemic one and the vital elements of an older cultural industry system need to be integrably put into the analysis, not just, you know, forgotten about, which is what happens in so many of the debates about platformization or added as an afterthought. We shouldn't, in other words, exaggerate the transformations associated with platformization. As we all you know, run to jump on another academic bandwagon, i.e. the platform bandwagon of platform studies and so on. And I think it's important to say that there was never a time when lots of musicians could make a sustainable living from recorded music. There is a, an idea going round that somehow now fewer musicians are making a living from recorded music than before. There is, well, I was gonna say very little evidence to support that. I have seen no evidence to support that. If you think there is some, I'd love to hear about it. Live music, of course, devastated by the pandemic and supplementary activities such as teaching 
have been vital to the way in which musicians make a living since the industrialization of culture. This isn't a new thing. And the formal system of professional recording musicians making some money out of copyrights, essentially, has always coexisted with a vast informal sector of unsigned musicians, some of them who, of whom are professional, playing live music professionally, some are semi-professional, and lots of them are kind of pretty much amateurs. That's one of the interesting things about music as a cultural form, this vast pool of willing musicians who would many of whom would love to become successful musicians in the center of the industry, but for whatever reason can't. But there are some things that are different in the new system. And so I want to home in on this. And you know, perhaps in the discussion, we can talk about <coughs> whether there are any parallels in other um, cultural forms or the media forms that you, you study television, film, games, and so on. Um, Jason Toynbee has written, interestingly, about uh, he calls it the, the, the kind of vast informal sector that I've been talking about. Um, it, 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 he says that some of that world can be thought of as kind of proto-markets, less commodified spheres, still some commodification, but less commodified spheres, in which commercial impulses are constrained by factors such as love of music or romantic ideologies that set art against commerce and where music is seen as an expression of solidarity and so it contains the the, the capitalist impulse to maximize profit in those in those uh, spheres but in the new system the informal sector of musical activity that used to exist outside the core has now been increasingly incorporated into one vast system of data capture. So everybody is on Spotify, everybody is on Apple, everybody is on YouTube. Most people who, I mean, by everybody, I mean all musicians who have recorded their music in any form whatsoever. It's all there on the same system. And there are very, very few alternatives to it. This is another transformation that I think is real and is not exaggerated. The one that nearly everybody talks about is Bandcamp, which some of you might use, which is essentially, it's not really a platform in the sense that we would normally define that. It's a kind of retail website. Uh, and you know the fact that that always comes up as a potential alternative to the tech platforms is, I think, indicative of uh, how little alternative there is to this new system. But the key point for me is the last one, that this vast reservoir of what you might call surplus musical labor, all these willing musicians are now part of a datafied system where success is largely, not entirely, but largely dependent upon opaque algorithmic recommendation systems. But here's where I want to emphasize some potential contradictions. In a dialectical twist, the fact that all musicians who make recorded music are now part of this vast datafied system, rather than there being a professional inside and a semi-professional and amateur outside, this seems to have generated demands on the part of music workers, on the part of musical labor and their public supporters for better pay and conditions, which in my view, being pro-musical labor is a very good thing. The problem is that the critiques are often founded on misunderstandings and simplifications. So it's good to have the critique, it's good to have the demands, but often they're based on false premises, leading to massive confusion in the debate. And then another interesting twist is that music streaming platforms 
especially Spotify, seem to have responded to the bad publicity created by these increasing demands and the publicity around them by seeming efforts to spread demand down the so-called long tail. I think you all know what the long tail is. I hope you do. You know, the idea of a popularity curve where digitalization makes available millions and millions of products and, 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 and producers. Um, uh, and so niche markets become more and more important economically and culturally. That's the idea. Um, why? Here's an example of this, or here's some evidence that Spotify at least seems to be doing this. Spotify, by the way, is a little bit more transparent about what it does than the other tech companies. But um, this is a graph produced by Spotify itself, but I think the, the data is reliable. Um, their campaign to show that they care for artists is based on the idea that they are increasing the number of artists who achieve the top 90% of all streams on Spotify, which is billions every year. And on the left, you see that the, uh, their data apparently shows that in 2015, 16,000 artists achieved the top 90% of all streams on Spotify. In 2017, that had gone up to 22,000. In 2019, it had gone up to 30,000. And in 2020, it had gone up to 43,000. Now, that can only really have happened, I believe, as a result of concerted efforts on the part of Spotify to uh, modify the recommendation algorithms to push demand in that direction. Okay. Uh, we can debate that afterwards if you disagree with that premise. I think there's evidence in it, by the way, in the uh, publications of Spotify research scientists um, who, you know, buried away in obscure computer studies conferences have discussed how to, how, how to do this. Okay, um, I'm just going to check for time. Uh, I think uh, I was told 40 minutes, and I think I might have been speaking for about 33. Is that right, Delia, roughly? If I, if I could have about seven or eight minutes more. this I just wanted to uh, try and indicate some of the cultural issues. I've, I've focused, if you like, on the political, economic and organisational dimensions. But believe me, I am as interested in the cultural dimensions as in the political, economic dimensions. Um, so I want to briefly here indicate some work I've done that's just been published in the journal Cultural Sociology, where I try to address um, popular critiques of music's effects on streaming culture. And uh, as I've been arguing with the kind of political economic critiques, both the popular and the academic critiques, in my view, are often too monolithic, too simplified, too undialectical and too unsociological. Um, so these are claims about how music streaming is damaging musical culture in general, and not just, you know, things like payments to musicians, not just the, the kind of um, industry. For example, what you hear a lot is the idea that um, music streaming has made um, music consumption more passive. Um, for those of us in media studies, it's like hearing, you know, maybe for those of us who've been in media studies for a long, long time, you know, there used to be this term couch potato that was used in popular and, uh, and to some extent academic critiques of television consumption in the 1970s and 80s. And th these kind of rather dubious ideas about audience passivity have, have, have come back in a remarkable way in these critiques of, of, of music's effects on streaming culture. And the term lean back listeners, which is a kind of tech industry term, you know, lean back and lean forward consumption. Um, you know, the idea of lean back listeners has been used to say, well, the tech industry wants everybody to be passive. So these are among the kind of uh, ideas that are being circulated, but um, 
I want to focus in the article in cultural sociology that came out a couple of weeks ago, I uh, differentiate five different strands of critique that are apparent in recent um, me media coverage and, and you know, social media um, uh, discourse. I just want to look at one which concerns the question of whether platformization has created a situation in which the functional aspects of music have begun to crowd out the aesthetic dimensions of music. And just to explain briefly what is meant by that, it's referring to the way in which music streaming platforms as a whole uh, offer experiences that are packaged in a way to direct you to their functional uses. So um, off the top uh, and, and to mood orientation. So off the top of my head, uh, working out playlists, you know, playlists that you're meant to play in the background while you, you're at the gym, you know, on your headphones uh, or on your um, treadmill at home, if you're into that sort of thing. And the idea, uh, or, or another one would be relaxing or going to sleep. You know, a lot of people play uh, uh, streaming playlists as they try to get to sleep. Um, chill is a big one, you know, that you create a, a relaxed ambience to address the anxieties of everyday working lives that we all know so much about. Um, the anxiety on the part of the the, the concern on the part of the critics is that this somehow crowds out the aesthetic dimensions of music. A, a notable uh, a, example of such a critic is the American journalist Liz Pelly, who in a series of articles in the Baffler magazine has claimed things like that the uh, ambition of music streaming platforms, and she particularly has it in for Spotify, is to, as she puts it, turn all music into emotional wallpaper. Um, the term music gets used a lot. Um, she writes that Spotify makes music conform to an emotional regulation capsule optimized for maximum clicks. And she says, that Spotify's intense attention to mood and to these activity-based playlists that I've just tried to explain contributes, as she puts it, to all music becoming more like music. Um, and Pelly's concerns have been echoed. Um, she was she wrote a series of articles in 2017 and 2018, which got huge traction, including huge social media sharing, and have come to define the debate about music streaming platforms and their effects on culture in many ways. Um, so, you know, I'm not just choosing Liz Pelly randomly, and I want to recognise Liz Pelly's importance in polemically getting people to think critically about music streaming platforms, even though I'm expressing some reservations about her approach here. Um, academic researchers have, have kind of echoed these critiques of, of what we might call the musical functionalism of music streaming platforms. For example, Paul, Paul Allen Anderson writes that contemporary music streaming platforms are a form of neo-music. Uh, which works as an oral, uh, an, sorry, an hourly administered effective mood stimulant and mood elevator by forestalling exhaustion and boredom. The political theorist Paul Reckert writes that streaming offers a more individualized, personalized version of music, embodying, quote, a movement away from music, music's embedded social meaning towards its identification with social function. Um, Maria, Maria Erickson and Sophia Johansson write that Spotify's featured playlists, quote, serve as a disciplinary technology that promotes a certain type of subjectivity informed by positive thinking as a contemporary ideology. Um, and Maria Thompson and Eric Drott write that music is increasingly put to work, especially in the pandemic, 
uh, their piece was published in response to the pandemic to enable uh, social reproduction. So briefly, how might we think about these concerns about music's functionalism, which, by the way, are mingled with a concern about musical banality. You know, it's, all, it's linked to the idea that music has somehow become more banal and dull as a result of this. Um, you know, that's what's going on in the Muzak metaphor, I think. Music, I mean, it's, it, it obviously has often been tied to function, both in terms of social ritual, funeral music, religious festival music, and so on, or a more intimate level, singing lullabies to get children to sleep, and all points in between. And I think in that context, the, this kind of tremendous anxiety about using music to accompany other activities can seem rather odd. After all, if the objection is to music serving a function beyond music itself, then dance music would fall foul of such critiques, wouldn't it? You know, logically. At work in some expressions of concern about musical functionalism, I think, is a certain version of the notion of the autonomous artwork. The idea that art should stand separately from social function in order to achieve its full aesthetic or, and or political power. Um, Janet Wolfe's great work on this from the 80s reminds us that the, ideal, the ideology of autonomous art is the idea that art, or at least great art, transcends the social, the political, and the everyday. And I think few people would defend such a view today, at least not by invoking the idea of transcendence with all its religious and spiritual connotations, as if art can soar free of racism, colonialism, sexism, and social suffering. Nevertheless, I think a version of that ideology seems to underlie many of the criticisms being made of streaming's musical functionalism. And I think it's interesting that music sociologists uh, and ethnomusicologists more distance from romanticism and modernism than cultural critics have tended to approach the use of music to serve function with somewhat more sympathy than cultural critics and with greater regard for what people actually do with music and uh, you know a classic example of this you know per perhaps the the key work of music sociology of the last uh, 30 years is Tia Dinora's book Music in Everyday Life. Dinora sought to understand music's powers by examining neglected cases of music's so-called agency, you know, how music would be put to work. Um, and I think, you know, maybe familiar to those of us from media studies because he echoed the emphasis on audience activity and agency in cultural studies in the 1980s and 1990s, though, you know, in an extremely sophisticated way in Donora's sociology of music. But what I want to suggest is that uh, uh, the work of Dinora and others, including some music psychologists, raises the possibility that these uh, critiques, these expressions of concern about musical functionalism, risk a certain unconscious snobbery and elitism about the ways in which people use music to get themselves through the day or to prepare themselves for action of some kind, like going out with friends or working out in a gym. So just some very final closing comments, and sorry if I've, I've slightly over, overrun my, my, my time. I want to suggest that we need a more sociological and also a more dialectical understanding of, um, of music production and of musical value that would allow for a more nuanced and complex understanding of problems associated with streaming. Um, and I can give you some examples of the way I think that would work, but I'm going to skip that. I would also say that we know very little yet about actual experiences of music streaming. There is some good work on it, but it's kind of 
in its infancy really and i'm keen to try and explore that more in the research project that uh, that uh, is about to begin um i think that um many claims critical claims such as those of musicians pay require a much better grounding in political economic explanation and theorization rather than sociological um analysis of experience which is needed too and so i guess overall what i'm suggesting that is that if the kinds of limitations of critique that i've been identifying in the realm of music are apparent in other domains in other form and culture then it may be that the current state of popular and academic critique of platformization needs to more generally avoid simplification of political economic and organizational processes and of cultural experience okay so i'll leave it there thank you very much for listening and i'm, I'm going to um try and get rid of my sharing ending show and then moving that picture of everybody okay thank you oh, thank you so much david and to make most of our time i should i suggest that we just jump right in and the floor is open so please raise your hands if you have uh, questions or comments and